Hello, my name is Tess Neal, and I'm an assistant professor of psychology at Arizona State University. I'm here today to tell you about a new paper that we've just published. Imagine that you or someone you love becomes involved in an unexpected legal issue. Perhaps a divorce is filed and a decision about the custody of shared children will have to be made. Or after a bad car accident, the victim in the other car uh, de develops symptoms of post-traumatic stress and sues you for emotional harm. Or even worse, you witness your loved one being threatened by a stranger. You act to protect your loved one and you end up killing the stranger. Your thoughts, your actions, and your history will be examined by the court, all of which will weigh into the punishment you receive, including whether, how long, and where you will serve a criminal sentence. For help in making decisions like these, the court often turns to mental health professionals. Each year, hundreds of thousands of psychological assessments are conducted and used in court to help uh, judges make legal decisions that profoundly affect people's lives. The professional field that offers psychological assessment services to the court is called forensic psychology, and it's been growing steadily over the last few decades. Over the same period of time, there's been a major increase in the creation and marketing of psychological assessment tools. Psychological testing is a big business industry. There are thousands of different kinds of psychological tests, and they're often expensive to use. People might assume that psychological tests sold by reputable companies are based on strong science, but this assumption is problematic. To be clear, there are some excellent psychologists doing science-based, um, scientifically informed evidence-based assessments. However, many others are not. We know this because we looked in depth at the psychological tests that are used in legal settings, and we also read, uh, we also closely read actual legal cases that included this kind of evidence. Our new finding in this paper is that there is substantial variability in the scientific underpinnings of psychological tests. Although some of these psychological assessments have strong scientific foundations, many others fit criteria the U.S. Supreme Court has described as junk science. For example, we were able to clearly identify only 40% of these tools as having generally favorable scientific properties. This is a problem because bad psychological evidence may contribute to unfair legal processes and unjust verdicts. The problem is made worse because the courts are not separating the good from the bad. Even though courts are required to screen out junk science, one of the major findings of our paper is that nearly all psychological assessment evidence is admitted into court without even being screened. So what can be done to fix these problems? In our open access paper, which is free to the public at the publisher's dedicated website and also on my own website, we offer concrete advice for members of the public interacting with psychologists in the legal system, for lawyers and judges, and for psychologists. For the public, encourage your attorney to scrutinize psychological assessment evidence. For lawyers and judges, investigate the methods of psychological expert witnesses using easily accessible and credible sources, which I'm happy to answer questions about. For psychologists, uh, for the mental health practitioners, be more diligent in selecting your tools. And for the scientists, uh, engage in more critical review processes before taking your new products to market. We believe all these things have the potential to make the legal cases in which psychologists are involved more fair and just. I want to say a quick thank you to my four collaborators, um, Chris Lebogan, Michael Sachs, David Fagman, and Kurt Geisinger, who propelled this project forward, as well as to the 34 graduate students, law students, and postdocs who made this project possible. Hi, Robert Frederick, American Scientist Magazine. This question is for uh, Dr. Neal Tess. Uh, it sounds like there's quite a lot of injustice that has happened in the past. Will your research be aiding lawyers to try and look at old cases and try and bring them back up for reevaluation? So I don't have any data about whether these have actually contributed to injustice. I I'm sort of curious to see what happens after this paper comes out and if people start paying attention or looking into this, what kinds of cases might be uncovered. Um, and I, I think there's potential for that kind of thing to happen, but I don't know any specific cases. Tess, when you uh, did the analysis of the psychological assessments and you saw the, the flaws leading you to understand the, the nature and significance of the errors, what, what did they look like? What was that variability and, and what were the signals of concern? So we started by looking at what the Supreme Court um, defines as the standards that judges are supposed to look at to determine whether evidence should be admissible or not. And there's four, the Supreme Court has said this, and then it was codified in um, the Federal Ru Rules of Evidence as well. There's four things that judges are supposed to look at, in addition to other things that they might want to. Things like, has this um, technique that the expert is trying to use, has it ever been tested before? What the expert, the method of the expert, whatever they're trying to testify about, 
Um, has it been generally accepted in that expert's own scientific community? Do other people think that this is legitimate? Uh, what's the error rate associated with the technique? Um, and has it ever been peer reviewed? And so we looked at, th those were kind of the guiding criteria for what we looked at in our analysis. Uh, and so we looked for evidence of testing. Turns out for psychological tests, almost all of them are tested. And then we also looked at um, these review sources for the psychometric properties of the various tests that we know are in use in legal settings. So we looked at things like error rate and things like the reliability and validity of these tools. Can they measure what they purport to measure um, in a way that's valid and should be claimed as such? And we found quite a bit of variability there. Uh, so only 40% of the tools that we looked at really had strong um, psychometric properties. A lot more had... So 40% had strong. There was another chunk of them that had mixed properties, like sometimes they look good depending on the context, and then there's a whole other chunk that just have poor psychometric properties. Is that because the people who are writing the tests need different kinds of training and insight and perspective, or what's going on there? I think part of the issue is that this is a, a big business. So there's some big companies out here that are publishing these tests and sort of looking for the next, you know, the next test that they might be able to publish. And I think uh, there is some tension between scientific development and making sure a tool is right before it goes to market. I think that's one thing. Um, another thing is that, I, I mean, I'm a practitioner by training too, and nobody ever, I mean, I'm trained. I know I'm supposed to go look at the psychometric properties of a tool before I decide to use it. But I didn't, I, I did not have a good concept that some of the stuff that's being marketed to me is not a strong tool. Um, and I just, I, I don't think that many other people are even aware either, many other clinicians in practice. So I hope that partially this will be educating everyone that everybody needs to be more scrutinizing. Hey, I'm uh, Julia Köppel von, uh, from um, Der Spiegel in Germany. And I have a question to you, Tess. Um, do you know whether these uh, tests are used abroad as well or only in the U.S.? There are definitely tests that are used abroad as well. Um, kind of the, one of the next things I want to do is work with people in other countries. I have some collaborators in Australia um, where we're starting to work on some of this as well. And I, definitely this is a, a worldwide um, situation. They're also used in Europe. There are German forensic psychologists who are testifying in court using tests. This one's over here. So judges have, uh, Tom Keenan, Business Edge, judges have two decisions to make. One is, is the evidence admissible? And then as to weight, do you have any indication how much weight is being put on these? Is there a way to measure that? Yeah, so judges... Um, judges definitely have the admissibility decision to make, and they make that decision in the absence of a jury, right? But the weight question could be for the judge to weight, or it could be for a jury. And so if a lot of the cases that we read, um, some of the commentary that judges would write was that, yeah, we're going to go ahead and admit this even if it was challenged because these issues should go to the weight and not to the admissibility. So that was kind of a common refrain that were in the opinions of the judges. Um, but then in terms of whether the jury is weighting this information or the judge, I think it depends on, there's there's a lot of factors at play in any given case. And if this information about the validity and reliability of the test comes up and jurors or judges are aware of how the psychometric properties of a given tool look like, then they might be better able to weight them appropriately. Thank you. Um, my name is Alok Cha. I'm, calling, I'm from The Economist. Um, Dr. Neil, can I just ask you to flesh out a little bit more about the psychological tests that you mentioned? I mean, this is maybe in your paper, so sorry, sorry. Um, what kinds of psychological tests? What do they do in the in the courtrooms? I mean, are they um, tests that the witnesses themselves take? Just give me some colour about what what these these are, and and then which ones are the ones that tend to be not so good? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. There's a lot of variability here. There's a, a lot of different ways in which uh, the, the legal system has questions about features of people who are coming before the court. Um, so things like um, the, the legal question is sometimes synonymous with what a psychologist can answer, but oftentimes there is a leap, an inferential leap. So that the legal question that, that's most on point with what a psychologist can answer is eligibility for capital punishment. So the U.S. Supreme Court has said if somebody is intellectually disabled enough, they are ineligible to, for capital punishment based on the Eighth Amendment against uh, cruel and unusual punishment. There is a psych psychological test, good ones, IQ tests that have... Their IQ tests are probably the most valid and reliable tests that psychologists have at their disposal. 
an IQ test can tell you with a high degree of precision and reliability what somebody's um, intellectual capacity is, and there is a particular score, there's a particular diagnosis, and a psychologist can say the person meets this diagnostic criteria or they don't. If they meet it, then the U.S. Supreme Court says the person's ineligible. So there, the psychological question and what a psychologist can do with a test is right on what the legal question, uh, legal question is. In lots of other cases, what a psychologist can do and offer is far, far, much further away from what the legal system is asking. So for instance, in a child custody case, the legal system has to decide, the judge has to decide what's in the best interest of this child. There's all kinds of tests that psychologists can use. They can do personality um, assessments of the parents. They can do IQ assessments of the kid. They can do all kinds of things to speak to which parent is in the best interest of this child or who, who, who has um, better parenting capacities or something like that. But there's at least a dozen different kinds of questions that the, the that the legal system might ask a for a psychologist to help answer things like violence risk assessment to inform somebody's criminal sentence the more violent they are the more potentially violent they are the more significant their violence might be would increase a criminal sentence um, or or make somebody end up in a facility that is a higher um, higher, uh, tighter form of custody, I can't think of the right word, um, and many other different types of questions. If, if you're curious about this, uh, in our paper, the first paragraph of the paper lays out a whole bunch of different questions that the legal system might turn to a psychologist to ask for help answering. Uh, so you mentioned that these tests are expensive. Who pays for these tests in court cases when they're sold by for-profit companies? Yeah, so initially the psychologist buys them, right? So they're marketed to the clinician, and the clinician uses their money to buy. And there's a lot of pieces that you have to buy sometimes. Sometimes you have to buy an administration manual, a scoring manual, the actual materials that a person might use. Oh, I was going to say in response to the previous question, there's a lot of ways in which these assessments are done too. So sometimes it's just a form you give to the evaluee. They, they fill it out like a true and false kind of thing. Or um, other times there are... Um, you know, the clinician will sit there with an administration book and have to say things in a certain way and ask questions in a certain way and then score what people are, how, however they respond, like what that means about that person. Um, and so the psychologist has to buy those things up front and then that recoup that cost in whatever they charge um, the person who's paying for the referral question, right? So it's usually an attorney or a court who's hiring the psychologist to answer whatever question they want answered. Um, so that, that cost gets turned over. Um, also, in response to the previous question about which tools are better and which tools are worse, I was going to mention that projective tools are probably the, the least scientifically reliable uh, and valid. Uh, there's definitely some controversy about that in the literature, but a projective test is, for example, the Rorschach inkblot test. So if you give somebody um, a a stimuli and you say what does this look like to you or um, tell me what this uh, could be then you sc then the clinician would score whatever that person says um, to mean something about that person and infer something about that person and their parental capacity if it's a child custody case or their violence risk if it's a sentencing hearing um, so those those are the most scientifically questionable and we find strong evidence that they're definitely in use another question in the back uh, yeah, this is uh, a question also for Tess uh, from Colin O'Connor with AAAS. Uh, he asks, are the assessments in your study used only used by professional witnesses or are they also used in state-ordered psychological evaluation? Um, they are used for all kinds of reasons. Um, I don't know that I understand the distinction that you're making, Colin, uh, but they're used they can be used in forensic and court context for all kinds of things. They can also be used in um, education settings. So for instance, if uh, a teacher or a, a school system is trying to determine who's eligible for gifted and talented education or special education, a psychological test will be used to help make that determination. Um, in um, employment settings, a lot of times there are psychological tests that are used for hiring decisions and so forth. So they're used in all kinds of ways. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Another question online, and then... Yes, uh, this is another question from uh, Nicholas Luco with El Mercurio uh, for Dr. Neal. Uh, what is your opinion of the lie detector procedure as we see in films? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the other panelists might have a good answer for this too. <laughs> I, will, I, I will say 
the history of it's really interesting. So that when it first was um, trying to be admitted to court, the person who was trying to uh, bring it to court was definitely a credible scientist, um, had a background in um, physiology and biology, I think, but it was a psychologist who was measuring um, differences in people's physiological reactions when they were lying versus telling the truth, and then was trying to infer from those things, actually, yeah, was trying to infer from those things whether you could use measurements like that to determine whether a given person, given their own physiological reactivity, whether they were lying or not. So there, there was sort of a, a, a leap there in what he was able to do and what he was trying to do with the court. So when he brought it to court to say, I want to use this in a uh, legal case to make a decision for court for you to make a decision, I think this was 1923. It was Fry, Fry versus United States. That was the case in which the law decided we need to have some way to determine whether something is junk science versus not. That was the case that started all of the uh, situation. And that case decided that the way to screen evidence was whether it was generally accepted in the field. So it was not very well known yet in, in psychology, uh, so the court looked to other experts in that field to say, is this lie detector thing something that people are using? And at the time, the answer was no, and so the court said it's not admissible. Uh, that was the first time that they had these criteria for um, deciding whether something was valid or not. Now, I would say there's a lot of controversy. Um, in a lot of legal settings, it's still not admissible, and yet it's in use in a lot of um, contexts. So the military, I know, uses the lie detector test for all kinds of things, um, and I would just say that there is some controversy still. Awesome. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other questions, thanks so much to our speakers. That was a very insightful briefing, and we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.